The Expansion Zone with Sonia Barrett. Everybody's talking about consciousness. Everybody wants that eternal kiss. Yeah, everyone's saying there's more than this. Everyone wants to follow their own bliss. Talk about one love. One blood. One love. On the Expansion Zone, we examine life and our quest to understand who and what we are and of the vastness of human potentials. We explore the making of our world from quantum physics to parapsychology, health, sociology and philosophy along with practical living. You are reminded of the possibilities in creating personal change. So for an hour, we'll stimulate and expand the mind. Well, welcome once again to the Expansion Zone with Sonia Barrett. I'm, of course, your host, Sonia Barrett. And uh, thank you for tuning in, for joining me again on this glorious Monday, despite everything that's going on in our world. You know, we still have to find other ways to, to look at it and make it a glorious Monday. And uh, I'm so grateful to all of the uh, responses, the emails that I receive about the shows that uh, I've been presenting and especially at, at this time because they don't all focus on, they don't really focus on going on per se. I think, you know, we can only do that so much. So I think something that I, I try to remind folks of on social media the other day, but it's that the reinforcement of an idea happens through repetition. So I say, you know what? Stop chanting the name of the virus over and over. And, and, and also in all the streaming that goes on, you know, the news and all of the updates all day long, don't spend time uh, just tuning into that all day. Uh, I say work on rewriting your personal stories. Th those stories that... Uh, and belief systems that have been shaping your life. Make internal changes and stay empowered. So I'm telling you what I'm doing. It's, you know, I'm doing what I need to do for me and keeping my mind and my body whole. And that's, that's you know, my focus at this time. So today I'm excited because we, uh, we're going to do a part two with Peter Moon because we did a we did the, the part one not too long ago, and that was in reference to Peter Moon's new book, L. Ron Hubbard, L. Ron Hubbard, The Tao of Insanity. And I did receive quite a few responses on it. They loved it, but they also wanted more. They, you know, it was said, you've got to do a part two. And so Peter and I knew that because, you know, he kind of gave us um, an, an intro and, and then we're going to go to the next part of it. But I've encouraged everybody for the fullest degree of, of information, which, you know, extending on, on expanding on what Peter is going to share with us today. So uh, just as a quick reminder of what the, the uh, book is about, a little summary, L. Ron Hubbard, The Tao of Insanity, Deeply into the Occult, uh, Unpinning the Occult, on pinnings of this man and his mission to reveal deeper insights into the matrix that he operated in that put him at the center of so much intrigue that surrounded key players in the military industrial complex, such as Robert Halen, um, Jack Parson, and Marjorie Cameron. Now, of course, Peter Moon is primarily known for his investigation of space-time projects 
these concerned projects in the past, present, and future that control both time uh, and perception of time. And of course, this began back in 1990 when Peter met scientist Preston Nichols, one of the world's foremost experts uh, in the world on electromagnetic phenomenon who had been involved in strange experiments at the Montauk Air Force Station on Long Island, which included the manip manipulation of time. So anyway, this collaboration in writing the Mon Project, Experiments in Time, and its subsequent sequels have now reached legendary proportion. Preston, of course, passed away October of 2018. And Peter Moon has since then, of course, written quite a number of books. Um, and of course, his latest, as I said, is L. Ron Hubbard, The Tao of Insanity. Um, and it was my, my then, I think, 18-year-old son, it, it was some time ago, um, that introduced me to actually to, to Peter, to um, the Montauk Project book. And I had the opportunity to interview Preston so many years ago. So Peter Moon, welcome back to the Expansion Zone. Thank you. You'll have to remind me of exactly where we left off because uh, <laughs> we went kind of down a narrow corridor, if I recall. Right. Yeah. Um, gosh, that's a good question as to where you left off. Um, I know you covered, oh boy, uh, I meant to actually get a handle on, on where we left off, but you gave a lot of um, sort of background um, on on him, and I think his, even his, was it his, a little bit of his CIA, was it involvement? Well, it was, it was more with regard to the subject of insanity. Right, uh, yeah, and you with, talk- With, with, with the story of this guy, Arnie Lerma, who uh, crossed Hubbard and ended up shooting himself. Yeah, you, know. you did cover that, right, right. No, right, yeah. right, and there was, I think it might be, it was one thing I wanted to wrap up that I didn't get to say uh, in the, uh, the last one, we could start off there, is basically the dictionary defines insanity as the state of being seriously mentally ill or madness. Mm -hmm. It also refers to extreme foolishness or irrationality. Now, what the key thing with insanity is, who determines whether you're insane or not? Now, this is, this is an arbitrary decision point. Uh, now, of course, there's a there's a wide dial we can choose to who's who, you know, we all might pretty agree, pretty much agree that so and so is out of it, you know, can't function properly. So they but in England, they had uh, the, the master of lunacy. He still exists. Uh, mm -hmm. Act of the, the Lunacy Act of 1878 uh, would up, call for the appointment of a master of lunacy who would determine the mental functionality of individuals. But he was also able to sequester their assets and provide for their care and treatment. Um, Master I, of lunacy. Yes, yes. And he would wear a long, you know, like one of those uh, wigs that English uh, magistrates would wear. And he right. would say, he'd pound his gavel and say, you're nuts. Now, <laughs> you know, and, and give me your your money. Now, the money would be used to, to care for them. Now, where this becomes very relevant is that this puts the, the person who is uh, adjudicating your, your, your sanity in the position of becoming a money grabber. And I, I put something interesting at the beginning of this chapter. It's a quote attributed to Jerome Lawrence, a playwright. <clears throat> it's a neurotic is a man who builds a castle in the air. A psychotic is the man who lives in it. Oh, interesting. A psychiatrist is the man who collects the rent. So I'll read that again because people will want to, what did he say? A neurotic is a man who builds the air. A psychotic is the man who lives in it. A psychiatrist is the man who collects the rent. Makes sense. <laughs> well, well, it, exactly. So what you're doing here with is come to the, the realm of insanity and dysfunctionality. It's it can be used as a powerful tool of a political regime. Uh, you have the words adjudication, insane, powerful, and political snugly and appropriately fitting together in the same, in the same reference. Now, where all of this becomes uh, 
you know, contextual is if you consider the age of the Inquisition, where insanity was closely aligned with heresy. So the, the, if they took a heretic, they could take his assets. And that became a ploy of the Inquisition, was, you know, who's rich in the environment? Let's dig up a case against them. And I would assume that they even had finder's fees. I don't know that. I haven't studied the history of it. But why not? Why not have a finder's fee? It's one heck of a business. I exactly. So this is what you have is you have people making decisions about other people, whether it be their beliefs or their relative sanity. And of course, you hear many beliefs in a, in a given day uh, that are that you might personally classify as insane or nuts. But there's a, a lot of freedom, you know, not not everybody is is going to be prone to being judged for them because after all they're just opinions but but when there's something attached to the opinion whether you know if you can give an opinion and get some attachment from it or if your opinion will cause you to lose attachment from something then it then it becomes a political issue and of course that's just one way to reference sanity because l ron hubbard himself said that there was a, a small body of people that ran the planet. And he said this, you know, long before it was, you know, popular, yeah. common mm -hmm. to say it. And mm -hmm. that basically they were vested interests and they backed organizations like the AMA, um, the World Psychiatric Association, or any psychiatric association, and that they worked hand in glove with each other. And he apparently had some inside knowledge of this by reason of his uh, position, his position in, in the intelligence community or, and or what he was privy to. Now, that's really, um, I mean, it's really interesting because I, it, there's a couple, couple of things, I won't say questions, a couple of things that it raises is the idea of determining, you know, who's determining who's insane and the barometers that are being used uh, for all of us, all of us really <laughs> determine who's crazy and who's not. And I don't think people think about what you're measuring against. And and we are, we're not going there on a conversation, but we don't realize how much we are measuring who's sane and who's not based on a lot of programming of what is sanity. <laughs> and that sure. might be off course, but that's basically what it makes me look at. And what you're, what you're told through the mainstream media, uh, you can see as we do this podcast, people are very much um, programmed or inclined to accept what authority is telling them, Absolutely. whether it's true or not. And what's because uh, people are walking around with uh, face masks on, uh, which is, you know, can be very unhealthy in their own right. But mm -hmm. if they were told to take off the masks by multiple sources, they would take them off. Absolutely. And, and that's, yeah. And, and I think in today's climate, de definitely you get an, a, a, an ability um, or an opportunity rather to really see the state of what well, human beings and the programming and the socializing of, of people, how easy it is, how pliable our minds are. So very, very interesting. Mm -hmm. Now, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, yes, I, I was going to say that um, to his credit, to his great credit, Alan Hubbard was the first person to expose uh, what he referred to, the, what he called it as PDH or pain drug hypnosis. Uh, pain drug hypnosis was, was what the government was using as a truth serum or to literally program somebody by using pain and drugs and, you know, put somebody in a hypnotic state through pain and drugs. And he exposed this in 1951 in his book, Science of Survival. Um, also in a book, uh, in, in a tape lecture of September 17th, 1951, entitled Black Dianetics, 
which um, actually he discussed the techniques of Hassan Saba of the assassin cult. And he stated that di the subject of Dianetics could be used to take over entire governments that up until uh, 1948, what he termed black Dianetics was, was in use by governments or similarly related control groups. Prior to that time, such knowledge of the mind, he said, was seldom, if ever, used positively for therapy. So when he came out in Dianetics, it was being used positively for therapy. How positive uh, it was is, is something that people can debate and is going to vary from individual to individual. But uh, he was the first one to expose, uh, at least in, in, in popular times, what, uh, what was going on there by the government. And you see the two two sides to the coin. This is the thing, and which is basically, you know, what one of the things he was saying is, um, it you know can be used for good, well, or evil. I'm just going to use those terms since people are familiar with that. I mean, it's like everything can can be used for both light and dark. I mean, it's it's really interesting how um, you can get positive results. But then another group can say they're getting positive results because then everybody is, is subdued. Well, it, exactly. And another aspect that I put forth that I, I've never seen in any other literature, uh, whether it be on the internet or otherwise, about Hubbard, and, and it's only because I had some firsthand experience with it, was that he had identified, well, there was a note he wrote uh, in his own handwriting one time that somebody had, um, I, I, I don't remember the reference, but it was that they referred to uh, Machiavelli. And Hubbard made a comment in writing that it was, that was his work. Mm -hmm. And further that Hubbard believed he was Lorenzo de' Medici. Now in history, regular history that you would read, Lorenzo de' Medici is the sponsor of Machiavelli. And mm -hmm. Hubbard is making this assertion that he was uh, Lorenzo and that, Machia and that Machiavelli had, you know, e either that Lo he, he published the work in Lorenzo's work in Machiavelli's name or, or whatever. I, I don't, that's not so horribly important, whether it's true. Uh, what's significant about it is that he studied Machiavelli he operated on Machiavelli's principles, and he identified with it so strongly that, that he identified himself with having written it. And that means that it was a part of who and what he was. And of course, Machiavelli's main principle, now it's important to point out that when you go to study political science in college, you're gonna study Machiavelli because this is the operating basis on which all geopolitics operates. And, and the prime directive is the end justifies the means. And what are the end is maintaining control. Absolutely, control. And that's what we see. Mm -hmm. Yes, and th this, this is a critical mistake. In, and I don't really go into it in this book so much. I went into it in a previous book Montauk Book of the Dead, but the, the key, uh, I guess what you'd say, failure of L. Ron Hubbard and, and his movement was not, was not that things didn't work. It was that in 1981, there was a, I guess, a mass uh, rebellion, and, and he started the rebellion. And the way he started the rebellion was by going into having, and this was highly confidential. I was one of a few people who were aware of this program or the inside of it. Uh, everybody who was in, in, around me was, was getting it administered to them. It was called de-oppression, de for short. And de-oppression was he would go around and say, you know, what is, you'd have people go around and say, what, what did you find oppressive in, 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 the, in this, the conditions of the staff or whatnot? And people would inevitably say, well, we don't get quite enough money. We don't get quite enough, you know, money for clothes. We don't get, we want the food to be better. They, they were really quite a very modest request. 
they were very relatively modest. So the response was to give people a little more money, give them, you know, better clothing, whatever it was. And this was great. And people loved it. And the esprit de corps was, wow, revivified. Now this spread out because this was the core of management it started with. And then it would spread out to the outer organizations and then into the field itself, the field meaning the, the Scientology public, which also included people who were not active or people who had been disaffected and fallen by the wayside. This spread out to them. So they're all asking the question, well, what do we want? We want uh, a little more bang for our buck, a little more for our money, a little more of this. We don't like these uh, disciplines that have been put upon us for whatever reason, correctly or incorrectly. And so this created a whole revolution. And where it became most prominent was in what were called the franchise holders or the mission holders. These were people who had a territorial uh, area where they applied Scientology on the lower levels. Um, I got involved, uh, entered in, in uh, the municipality of Davis, California. There was also a couple of them in Sacramento. There was uh, one in Berkeley, San Francisco, uh, all throughout Southern California, and of course across the United States and in foreign countries. These, the, the mission holder was usually somebody who was uh, not always, but more often than not, an impressive, charismatic character who could give good lectures and excite people and would impress the, his public. So he was considered what was called an opinion leader. And these people were usually uh, astute business-wise, and they would really give up. They were, uh, in t so were, as part of their agreement, they were supposed to give a relatively modest sum to the founding church, which was about 10% of their income, which, uh, and they were like licensed to do practice Scientology. Now these people were very, now, so when this got into their hands, they started uh, making their own demands. But what happened is it, it, it evolved into a whole uh, group psychological phenomena where these people had this huge meeting in Clearwater, Florida, where I uh, lived and worked at the time. And because it was my job to uh, correct things in the organization, I took it upon myself to go and observe some of these, which most staff, no, they, did, they were not supposed to be there. They didn't belong there. But I, um, I attended them by sitting outside the door and listening to them, not making myself a spectacle. And you had what was called a revivification uh, of enthusiasm that was spreading like wildfire. And they're basically telling senior management, you're not listening to us. Uh, you know, we, we can bring you the world. Just listen to us and we will give you everything you need. And in fact, what these people were doing was, it, it, I don't, can't exactly tell you what they were doing or how they were doing, but they were creating such enthusiasm in the Scientology movement that they were giving these big gatherings. And I can't compare them to Werner Earhart's EST, but I can't uncompare them either. And what they were doing is these guys were raking in hundreds, two hundreds of thousands of dollars in a week on just sheer enthusiasm. And they weren't doing it to get rich or to be greedy. They were saying, we want to feed this up the organization. We want, we, we're, we want to stop this. We want to fix the whole planet with Scientology. Their enthusiasm was genuine. It was, it was had rough on the edges. And they said, they'd say, and as I talked to these people, they said, we, we are good at getting people in and exciting people. What we're not good at is the precision of the technology and getting it really right. We can get people interested on the lower levels. We need the help of the, the mother church, the C organization to, to apply these techniques properly and correctly. We need the help. We can't do it alone. So we're not misguided. So all of this was just fantastic. It was like reviving not only the, the public Scientologists and the, the, uh, the, some of the management staff, 
not all the management staff, some of the management staff was anal retentive about it, feeling threatened uh, by all this good news. And then uh, at that time, the guardian's office, which was their, what would you call it? Sort of their Gestapo, mm -hmm. uh, their, their heavy duty legal organization. One of their representatives told me, he said, what we've done is in response to all this, we've dropped all the lawsuits against us have dropped because we have communicated with the, the injured party. And they just, all they wanted was communication, which is the hallmark of Scientology itself. So it was like, there was all this like, wow, everything's fantastic, everything's good. So what happened was uh, David Miscavige, the person who is currently in charge of Scientology, came down and he, he glad handed these people as best that he could. And then, you know, had them all disperse. Uh, you know, okay, we're going to listen to you, blah, blah, blah. He faked them. He did a, a good decoy. Hmm. And then he began to uh, report to Hubbard how, how these people were trying to take over Scientology, which was not the case. Well, I don't know exactly what he said, but he very much disaffected Hubbard of all of this. And, he, and I can't say where Hubbard how much he was influenced by these reports and how much of it was his own, uh, his own dysfunction because can't, I don't really know. I haven't seen all the reports. Um, it might've been a bit of both. It might've been definitely David Miscavige, but what had happened was uh, he started to single-handedly go to these mission holders and uh, isolate them and say, you know, you're, you're kicked out because, you know, blah, blah, blah. And he began to, de-enthused the entire public and the public became very disaffected. Uh, they, furthermore, those people who were getting counsel in Clearwater were not allowed to talk about this. If they, if they, if they started bringing it up in their auditing sessions or counseling sessions, they would be sent to the ethics department and told to handle whatever disaffection they had before they could continue their counseling. And, and it was a very oppressive maneuver and this began to ruin uh, the whole movement. Now, what, where, you know, Machiavelli teaches you, you want to have the hearts of the people, if you can, that's secondary, but you want to have it if you can. And at that moment, they lost the heart of the public. I could no longer uh, be part of get, be, get behind Scientology. I hung around for another year uh, to see if Hubbard would correct the situation. Uh, I didn't realize at that time how uh, far gone far gone he had been first by having his communication lines uh, removed uh, and and then I, I can't tell what his state of mind was. It, it leads me to think it was less than what it had been. but in any case, it was no longer something that I could stand behind and wake up in the morning and feel um, okay about what I was doing. But this is, this is a point um, where, and, and it also at that point, if, in other words, all he had to do was say, we won. It's like admitting that you won. He had been fought for 20, 30 years up to that time. And he could just say, okay. And he would have had so much support that any of the stuff going on to decry him would have been vanquished. None of the negative information would have come out or if it was, it could have been curtailed, and he could have won the hearts of everybody, or most everybody, enough people. And this did not happen, and the result is you have scandal, you have negativity, and it doesn't really matter how good or bad he was. It's like he had something to share with the world, and it would have been enthusiastically accepted on on many different levels to the point where uh and th this is where he failed and uh or his followers failed or however you want to say it and it's well, taken right 30 years to find out certain information that took place there but anyway that's that's uh but he started that's out. Where things went wrong with machiavelli right but but in terms of uh hubbard i mean he started out with great good intentions uh, i mean apparently but 
He had some good intentions. He had some good intentions. So, but, but it also, in just listening to you, you could see that there was an accumulation um, of so many ideas, so much information, digging deep, going deep into the rabbit hole. It's to some degree, it, you see where it sort of seemed to ma have made him, um, I'm, I'm going to say a little bit nuts, um, because the more he dug and the more he understood, because it seems like he accumulated so much knowledge and so much information um, because he was questioning everything. He was trying to find his way in this in this life and sharing it. So it, it, that's what it sounds like to me. There was so much that ultimately at some point, it seems like it all just sort of kind of went sideways. And but then, it, it did. And, yeah. and it, it, his, his great illumination became, become, with, for him becomes, uh, starts with what he calls the Excalibur incident, where he uh, had an out-of-body experience where he could see all the knowledge and wisdom that you know of the ages he, he had act, full access to it right you mentioned that the last time mm -hmm. yeah and and then then what was special about it he said was that he was able to remember it he said most people get into this realm and they forget it there's a command to forget it all so he began working on the fact wow i can remember this now he carried a part of that through with him throughout his life in other words he he remembered that he could remember and he was uh, I guess what you might say have in, invaded or accessed the quantum realm. And what was special about it was that he could transfer it into his writing and beyond his writing, he could influence the minds and wills of other people. And he had a tremendous influence on individuals. And, yes. and, and this is where he could, he could harness uh, what he had learned from the other realm. Um, Peter, we I think that we're going to stop and take a, a break, and I um, I hope you can hold on to that point. I but, was just about to ask for the same. So Yes. So um, when we come back, one of the questions uh, that kept coming up in people's response to the interview was they just needed more clarification on the, you know, what he meant, the idea of getting clear. So if, if you can also address that, because it came up on social media. We'll all right, so um, just stay tuned, and we will be right back after this quick break. KPFK invites you to join Global Village host John Schneider, music director Maggie LaPeak, and KPFK's Andrea Love on Thursday, April 16th from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. in celebration of Public Radio Music Day. At 1 p.m., Maggie will present a concert by Lady Smith Black Mombazo, originally produced by UCLA and KCRW. The concert became a posthumous tribute to Lady Smith's founder, Joseph Shabalala, presented without an audience at UCLA's Royce Hall after the onset of the coronavirus. The concert will begin with an interview with UCLA's Center for the Art of Performance Artistic Director, Christy Edmonds. That's a celebration of Public Radio Music Day on Thursday, April 16th from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. right here on KPFK 90.7 FM Los Angeles and streaming on the web at KPFK. And we are back. Of course, we're coming to you from KPFK 90.7 FM in Southern California. And you're listening to The Expansion Zone with Sonia Barrett, and that would be me. We are chatting with my guest, um, Peter Moon, and uh, we're talking about his new book, L. Ron Hubbard, the the Tao of Insanity, and uh, I'm going to let Peter pick up where he left off, and we are going to be talking about um, also the this concept of being clear, as many of you wanted a bit more clarification uh, about that. The state of clear, if you go to the Dianetics and Scientology Technical Dictionary, the definition, there's about 13 definitions, and it's over a page. So it is a clearly a description, which the description of which evolved over a period of time. And it changed. Some people take great issue with it, but where the to give people an idea of what it originally meant and signified was, and this is in, in his own work, uh, I believe it was in the book, um, 
Dynetics, the Evolution of the Science, and he talks about an adding machine. He says, if you're computing with an adding machine and doing numbers, he says, if the seven is held down continuously, in other words, it's dysfunction, you're going to get wrong answers. No matter what you add up, this seven's always going to be held down and throw in sevens that don't belong there, and you're going to get wrong answers. And he says, the whole idea of clearing a mind of an individual is to have no quote unquote held down sevens. So it's, it's clearing the mind of what he originally called impediments or things that would make it impure, uh, impure functioning. You could say dysfunction. It's this is modern terminology is dysfunction. Now there's also, I like to bring up this analogy. Um, there's sometimes you'll see it in a movie and certainly drill with a drill sergeant, a drill sergeant will look up into some, you know, some person who's dysfunctional like Gomer Pyle or somebody like that. And he'll look into the private and he'll say, what is your major malfunction? And of course that is, I used to joke uh, amongst Scientologists that this is like a, uh, a, a clearing question. What's your major malfunction? Well, you know, you know, I, I can't stand women because my grandma tried to burn me or something like that, you know, and then, you know, so that that's uh, that might be his major malfunction or why he can't interface with women. But anyway, there's also a definition of here to clear. It says to release all the physical pain and painful emotion from the life of an individual. To clear, you know, to get rid of the pain, the physical pain and painful emotion. That was an early definition. And certainly, if you can get rid of all physical pain and painful emotion, you're in a very good place. And it's, it's really that simple. It could, all, it could also be, it, it gets more technical when you get into more of the definitions of the mind and that sort of thing. But it can it, go it, very deep. There's layers to, I mean, it, what you're saying clear, it clearly shows that there are layers to this Le this the level of clearing that one can get to exactly and and uh yeah so, so it's like uh and then of course it can it can also be manipulated just as we talked in the early uh reference to black dianetics where one can use this and i will explain uh, what the criterion used in the church was and as i say this was not known by most of the staff it was certainly not known by most of the public, but where the criterion to determine if somebody was clear, if they would have what was called a cognition, it was called the clear cognition. And a, and a cognition is, is, is a moment of enlightenment where, where you've realized something. They call it a, a cog, cognition is like, wow, I, I realized that things are really this way. And that, which you wanted to hear them say to understand they were clear is that they are quote unquote mocking it all up. Mocking it up means to create, to make, to make a mock up, to, to mock up something. You are creating what's in your own mind. You are creating all of the illusions and visions in your own mind. They're your creation. In other words, you are a co-participant in the creation of what is going on. So if a person would say, oh God, I realize that I'm, I'm creating all of this this mental trauma myself. I'm creating all, all of this reactive mind. And when you said that, and you said it with uh, sincerity and honesty and genuineness, because you were never, this is why it was kept a great secret, because you didn't want people going in and mouthing it so that they could now say, oh, yeah, I'm clear, because a lot of things in Scientology were done for status. And that's not because of Scientology, it's because of human beings, you know, they would be very proud of, of their level of achievement. Yeah. And this, this was just, it, it, and, and, and I will tell you that whatever your level of training uh, or processing was uh, when you were on Hubbard ship, it, it, it didn't mean nothing. It, it's not that it didn't mean nothing, but it was like a black belt uh, in karate. You can walk into a place and say, oh, I've got a black belt and you can, easily get the hell knocked out of you if, if you don't have the skills to uh, back it up because 
you know, you can, you can, in other words, you can get a uh, high status or what would perceived as a high status in the martial arts when you really don't know as much as you would like other people to believe. So the, this, this applies across, like you see university professors who don't know very much. You see others that are brilliant. So it, it's... Well, I, I mean, I think what happens is people get um, studied concepts or you're trained, but you might be trained in the 10 steps and have become very good at this 10 steps, but that's, that's not all there is. And I think that's, that tends to happen across the board in many situations in the educational system and, and you know, just a period. So I, th I think that's what it sounds like you're saying. So yeah, you may have all the um, techniques that are required to allow you to get that black belt. But there's a whole lot more that, there that the person might not. So you have to be able to fight to, exactly. uh, to, yeah. to back it up. Uh, the black belt are, come, comes from originally the belt becoming so dark with dirt because you've been fighting in the dojo for so many years that you've got a lot of experience. So, you know, somebody's been in there, you know, for 10 or 12 years, they got his belts all black. He's a black right. belt. In other words, he's been, a, he's been through the rounds. It's not because he's done uh, a series of exercises or a series of katas or, or whatever regimens. Uh, it, it, that's not what it is. It's somebody who's, who's a veteran of uh, and an experienced fighter. Okay. Yeah, that makes absolute sense. Now, um, it, it raises the question then, you know, was he clear? <laughs> you know, what level was, you know, where was his clarity? At what level? Because this is where the idea of, um, you know, insanity or going, tipping, you know, tipping over a bit, you kind of wonder then, you know, what, you know, where was he in terms of his own clarity after, after a while? Because sometimes it's, it, it does seem like clarity, certain levels of it, did, can it drive you crazy? I mean, well, th th this, this, I will only give you, I'll, I'll start with my own personal experience with uh, what was told to me when I was, uh, I wasn't even in the Scientology movement for a year at that point. I'd been in it, I was, I'd pretty much finished the Dianetics course and it, it was probably August of 1971. And I remember there was a party. It was the first party of Scientologists I ever went to. And it was at the house of a, a former university professor who had, uh, since gotten into Scientology, he was not in the house. And, uh, and uh, I remember there was just a bunch of us sitting around. Now, I was, I, I was like, felt like the newbie. You know, I, I mean, I, I'd done the course, but I, these, I was talking to people who'd been down to LA doing higher level courses and they were talking. And one of the guys told me, he said, you know, he says, you know, Ron wasn't the first clear, you know, he says, um, there were other people that went for, and, he, and he, he began to tell me that that he said Ron did this for other people. He didn't do it for himself. He, you know, would sacrifice, make a lot of sacrifices for himself, you know. And in other words, he didn't have such an easy time of it. And that was how. And I say, oh wow! So this 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 whole thing of clearing and all these procedures he would lay out were not for himself. They were for other people, and he was putting people. You know, it's, you know, it's almost like a, from this perspective, it's like a, somebody teaching a high level karate who's in a wheelchair, you know, and maybe, Good analogy. maybe he's not in the wheelchair from fighting and, 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 and losing or, but he learned and he could, he could turn out some pretty incredible students. Uh, it's, it's, I'm, I'm giving that as a metaphor. Uh, and so. This was, this is how I was kind of introduced to the concept and that, that Hubbard was not, in other words, this was all an act of sort of self-sacrifice on his part from what his reference frame. In the early days, um, he would, you know, co-audit back and forth. And I, I talked to uh, one of his friends from that time period who was also one of his uh, students, Perry Chapladane. I don't think he's long, with us any longer. He used to buy all my books. He was a very nice man. And he said that um, he said that Hubbard, when you audited Hubbard, 
he was like, he'd go all over the place. He was not a, what you call a easily controllable pre-clear. He, he just like, you'd start the session and you would expect a, a normal person you're counseling to answer your questions, uh, do what you told him to do. But he, Hubbard would just be flying back into past lives and going all over the place. And he said he was very unruly and hard to control. And, and, and when I say control, it's, you know, when I, it's in the same sense as that if, if, I, if you're interviewing me and I just start blabbing incoherently, you're going to have to control me. You know, I can't just blab forever or it's, it doesn't work. And, and this is kind of what was happening. That's what it sounds like to me, though. I mean, which is why I asked the question, because when, when you said that, I could picture that because that's the vibe I get of, um, of, of this person. I think he, it's almost like he was so, I don't know, filled with not just information, but so much of what he thinks he saw or experienced. You know, that, he had that a lot it, of life it, in him. He had yeah, a lot of life and, in him. And, and it, over, it sort of overwhelmed him in a way, and it was very hard to navigate that. But it sounds like he created a formula. In his mind, what he created was a formula and a model for people to, um, to go through these different levels of getting clear. Yes, and he didn't necessarily have to follow the rules himself. Exactly. Because he was, he was uh, what he called the goal maker. And, you know, the goal maker does not – you know, he's different. He's outside of humanity. He looked at himself as being outside of humanity. And uh, he saw himself as, G didn't you see, him see himself as Jesus, Jesus Christ? No, no, no. Well, that, that was, that. he never said that. That was okay. somebody said he. Okay. Claiming that. Okay. He did see himself as Buddha. He did. Oh, well, so, well that's that very big, very different right there. Uh, Buddha. Yeah. Well, you know, Buddha, but from what perspective, you know, Buddha is, was supposed to be the Christ or Buddha, Buddha as interpreted as a man. You, you know what I mean? There's different. Buddha was, was a man and, and uh, he, he did believe himself to be the incarnation of the Thomas. Of Buddha. Buddha. Okay. And yeah. he wrote a whole book about it called him of Asia, which is more of a poem than a book. Uh, and, and, um, you know, and he, but he really did believe that, or yeah, he, at least. Well, that was a similar difference. It wasn't wasn't Christ, but he saw himself on a on a whole different level, um, which which is what allowed him to do all of this. Well, now, yeah, yeah, real quickly, this is on it can, sort of unrelated, but when you mentioned Werner um, Earhart, I, and I know his his connection with with Landmark, which Landmark, I've I've not gone to, but I've had a lot of people over the years go. You should go to Landmark, but. You know, Landmark always felt to me like uh, sort of a sub, you know, of of uh, Scientology. Not quite, but like it, it's it's sort of a, um, you know, what the word I'm what's the word I'm looking for? It, it has a connection in terms of I guess some of the, the the methods that they were using. Not that it matters here in this conversation, but it just sort of reminded me of that. Well, Werner, Werner Earhart um, has often been mislabeled as a encyclopedia salesman who, you know, uh, discovered Scientology and made all this, you know, cult following for himself. It's, it's not quite that simple. Uh, Warner Earhart was not simply an encyclopedia salesman. He was in charge of a sales division for an encyclopedia company. I believe it was Britannica, but I'm not sure. Anyway, he was in charge of a sales division. When he got involved with Scientology, he saw that there were many principles and techniques he could use to enthuse his sales team. Okay, uh, Scientology has a lot of techniques for helping sales. So he had, he had a whole division of people under him that he could woo, sway, and impress and help. And this is how he became a phenom in terms of having a built-in audience. And now, now, albeit he was skilled, he was already a, a skilled salesman enough to arrive to that, arise to that position. But Scientology took him over the top and then he began to export what he had learned and, you know, beg, borrow and steal from or whatever that and what other disciplines he used. Uh, and, and so it had a flavor of Scientology to it indeed. Uh, and he got involved with the Esalen Institute and just that and the other thing. Uh, became 
became a, a cult figure in his own right with, with uh, you know, many problems associated with it. But that, that's just to address the, right. the relationship of, right. of him and Scientology. Okay, yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah, but so, yes, it's clear where some of those concepts um, spilled over from. And um, I'm going to say, you know, it, so at what point here, it, it completely, because we, we hear so much about Scientology, and, you know, I've been kind of doing interviews about it for, you know, over the last umpteen years on and off. But that it's it's slipped into this very dark place where there's so many people that are coming out uh, talking about what it's like for them escaping and and all of this. Now, was it that way when when Hubbard was alive? I know it started to go in in this other direction. Uh, was it more so when what's his name um, Miscavige when he took over? Well, I I, I will. Uh, I'll give my perspective from what I know and, and understand to be uh, more than a little reasonably accurate. But but back when I was involved, uh, no, th th there there was not. Um, you know, you you could you could walk off the job and never come back. Uh, now there were certain instances in, in the rehabilitation project force where people were heavily monitored. Um, that, that that they they would be monitored because. Uh, at least in in one case, I can recall, which was a very problematic case, the person was, you know, suicidal or crazy, you know. So, um, and I remember this person got away, and, and there was a, a lot of it created a lot of ruckus. But the, some people had to be monitored, and there were confinements that were done that were, I guess, what you'd say, illegal or not kosher at best, but these were relatively few compared to what transpired as transpired in the last 20 or so years. Uh, these were often, uh, I wouldn't say that they were justified, I, but in some cases, you know, it was to limit the, you know, the harm to the individual. And of course the organization was always put first. But what, what happened in um, the desert unit out there that they, they have in, uh, near India, California, and they started building a fence. Now, this is, I don't know what time period this was. I think it was in the 80s. But they started building a fence around the compound, which was quite big, uh, telling the staff, that they were building this fence to keep out uh, you know, the suppressive people from the outside. It was only after they built the fence did many of them realize the, fe the fence was being built to keep them in. Hmm. And it wasn't being built to keep people out, it was being built to keep the staff in. And they went through ridiculous procedures where they might be s sleeping off that campus and they would have, uh, they would call roll calls they get everybody on the bus and have a roll call, everybody off the bus, a roll call, and, and do these things. I've only heard about them. I, I, that, they didn't do that stuff. So in other words, they, they were regulating everybody to make sure nobody would leave the premises. It was very tightly controlled. Sounds like um, the inmates are running the asylum. Well, yeah, well the inmates, <laughs> yeah, the inmates built their own asylum. They exactly. weren't running it, <laughs> you know. Really, they were participating well, I guess they were participating and running it is a better way to say it. So it became very restrictive. And you can read all sorts of horror stories about how people have to escape, uh, you know, busting through gates on a motorcycle, busting through, uh, escaping in a car, uh, you know, somebody picking them up by the side of the road and taking them to a safe harbor. I mean, you hear dramatic, dramatic stories. Um, these were not... Uh, I remember one, uh, I, I was on a nighttime watch at one of their hotels. I don't know what the hell I was watching. We have a couple of minutes left, just so you know. Oh, anyway, they, they, mm -hmm. some, some, some girl had escaped from the RPF, and, and I, I told the guy in the RPF, I said, well, you know, she got, so he chases her down to the airport, mm -hmm. and okay, she's gone, what can I do, you know, let her go, <laughs> you know. Uh, yeah. 
Yeah. yeah it, it, it does though. It, to me, um, I, I would look at it as, okay, so there has to be a level of, um, I, you know, what am I using to measure, you know, being crazy, but the fact that you are needing to confine people, I, you know, there's, there's a little bit of snapping. Everybody's like a little bit of eh, snapped. The, the folks running things, the folks in there that are tolerating their discomfort, it, it's a weird mix. The key to this, Sonia, is that people now sign away their rights. Exactly. In the name of religious uh, affiliation, and this compromises any any disputes, legal disputes they will have with the organization down the road. It compromises now. Because you 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 sign, you agreed, you agreed to the terms and conditions. I mean, that's kind of basically and signed over everything. But Peter, um, let's give out where people can get the book. Um, because that's really important. Sure. Skybooks, USA.com, Skybooks, S-K-Y-B-O-O-K-S, USA.com. And you can order the books uh, there, any of my books there, and including the, the new one on L. Ron Hubbard. And let uh, me tell you, Peter is a fabulous writer, um, really, really great uh, writer. So it's always a wonderful read in, in anything that, uh, that he writes. And, you know, we, the time always seems to fly by so super fast. And so I'm always hating to start something big in terms of a conversation um, and then go, okay, we're done. We're, we're out of time. But, it, you know, we have mm, seconds left. So um, any last thing that you want to say to the audience? No, this, this is a running conversation and, and we converse well so we could go on and on and on so but I mean, it's just, just the nature of it and if you get into the books uh it um uh, you can continue the conversation there in your own mind sounds great well i thank you so much peter for being here and folks um really remember this you know the idea of social obedience it's really really big uh so we have to begin to really look at ourselves and um what we are agreeing to and question everything, as I always say, and do your own research. So with that said, again, thank you, Peter Moon, for being here. Uh, thanks to the listening audience. Thanks to our engineer, uh, D'Angelo Jones. And you can listen to this in our archive, theexpansionzone.com, and all other interviews that we've done. you got to listen to part one as well if you haven't heard part one of this interview. As always, I remind you to live life to its fullest and question everything. And do visit my website, therealsoniabarrett.com. Until next time, see you then.